I'm delighted to welcome you to the 12th annual Dudley Allen Sargent Lecture. This lecture was begun in 1999 uh, to mark the 70th anniversary of Sargent College joining Boston University. Each year we invite a leading researcher or practitioner to address the Boston University community on a topic that's related to health and rehabilitation. As many of you know, this year is the 20th anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act. And so the faculty were interested in inviting an influential speaker who studied health care quality and delivery for persons with disabilities. We're delighted to have Dr. Lisa Iazzoni as our speaker today. Dr. Iazzoni received her undergraduate degree from Duke University and a master's in public health and an MD from Harvard University. She's an internationally recognized expert in predicting cost and clinical outcomes of care, in assessing health care quality, and also in assessing health care experiences and outcomes for persons with disabilities. Dr. Izoni's work has been supported by many agencies, including NIH, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and other private um, organizations. In addition to numerous articles, Dr. Izoni has published two extremely influential books in the area of disability research. Uh, one is entitled, When Walking Fails, Mobility Impairments of Adults with Chronic Conditions, and the other is called More Than Ramps, A Guide to Improving Healthcare Quality and Access for People with Disabilities. Dr. Izoni is currently a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of the Morgan Institute for Health Policy at Partners Healthcare. <coughs> Her lecture today is entitled Healthcare Disparities for Persons with Disabilities. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Iazzoni. All right, today feels like the first day of winter, doesn't it? Kind of really blustery and cold out there. Okay, so I wanted to take you back to the midsummer. This is July 26, 2010. It's really hot out. It gets to be 90 degrees in the afternoon, and the sun is shining and the sky is clear blue, and these are party people getting ready to party. This is the party. This is the celebration on Boston Common of the 20th birthday of what George Herbert Walker Bush said was arguably the proudest moment of his presidency. This is July 26, 1990, and the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, of course, people with disabilities need civil rights, but they're also just out there in the community participating and doing whatever they want to do. And often nowadays, people with disabilities are out front. And these are the elite wheelers at the Boston Marathon taking off. And I always like to say that they come in about 25 minutes quicker than the bipeds do. <laughs> OK? Um, and if there's one phrase that I'd like to kind of get expunged from your vocabulary based on this talk. It's the phrases, confined to a wheelchair and wheelchair bound. Because as you can see from the elite wheelers at the Boston Marathon, their wheels do not bind them. They're out there rolling. They're getting where they need to go. And even people who use wheelchairs to get around and aren't elite wheelers, we're not confined to our wheelchairs. They're a tool. They help us get around. And so the symbolism is changing with the ADA. And when people ask me, well, Lisa, what do you want us, us to say about you when we can't say you're confined to a wheelchair or wheelchair bound, I say, get rid of the metaphors. Let's just use a subject and a verb. Let's say Lisa uses a wheelchair. She's a wheelchair user. Now, there are 54 million people in the United States living with disabilities, according to census figures that were published for the July 26th, 20th birthday. And the numbers are growing. Now, obviously, people who are older are more likely to experience with disabilities, but there are hidden disabilities or disabilities are not, that are not necessarily relevant that are affecting all sorts of age groups of people. And this is the cover of a Newsweek magazine from a number of years ago that suggests that people who wear, what are those called, those little earbuds or something? Yes. <laughs> yeah, OK. The, the young students are telling me what they're called. Um, that this may not be all that good for your hearing in the long run. Um, and obviously, then, we have the tragedy of the Iraq and Afghani actions that are um, producing people with really significant disabilities who are living um, with injuries that never would have allowed them to survive in a number of years ago. 
Now, um, Alan Jetty, um, your former dean, well, uh, was the chair of this particular committee. This was the Institute of Medicine Committee on the Future of Disability in America that published a book in um, the year 2007 talking about the future of disability in America. And they made the point that disability in America is not a minority issue. It affects today, or will affect tomorrow, the lives of most Americans. So, okay, if all of us are in some way going to be affected by disability at some point, why is it so hard to make health care fully equitable and accessible to people with disabilities? In other words, in 2010, why do people with disabilities experience disparities in their health care? So, my talk is going to have four parts. I'm going to give you evidence of disparities to just kind of beat the horse and make sure that you agree. And I'm going to use um, breast cancer detection as the example of, um, of disparities. Then I'll give you some historical, and with apologies to the lawyers in the root view room who can correct me if I'm wrong, legal views of disability and disability rights. I'll talk a little bit about barriers to health care. And then finally, just a few slides about patient-centered care and universal design as solutions to these disparities. Now, starting in um, 2000, when the nation produced its, its decennial report on the priorities for improving health of the U.S. public, which it does every 10 years, and in fact, in, um, in a few weeks, they're going to be um, producing Healthy People 2020. Chapter 6 of 2010, Healthy People 2010, was all about people with disabilities, noting that they experienced disparities in their health care. Fifteen years after passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Richard Carmona, who was then the Surgeon General of the United States, um, issued a call to action, again noting disparities in health care, about improving health and wellness for people with disabilities. Um, every year, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality produces a report on disparities in care. Um, it focuses a lot on racial and ethnic minorities, but people with disabilities are also one of the target populations that are demonstrated to have disparities. And then finally, just last year, the National Council on Disability issued a report on the current state of health care for people with disabilities. So as you can see, there's just this growing body of evidence from our federal government of disparities in care for people with disabilities. So let's step back and look at what these disparities might be. Um, I'm going to focus today primarily on mammography because I'm talking about breast cancer, but let's just talk for a couple of minutes about some of the other disparities. This is from, from some work that we published a number of years ago. Women with major mobility problems compared to other women in reproductive age are 70% less likely to be asked by their doctors about contraception. Now, why might that be? Well, women with major mobility problems couldn't possibly be interested in sex, right? Mm -hmm. And be at risk of unintended pregnancies. However, as you might imagine, women with major mobility problems might be less likely to use barrier contraceptives because their hands might not work or whatever. And they might be also at higher risk of, um, of thrombophlebitis if they use hormonal contraceptives. So they really need to be talked to about it so they don't have uninten unintended pregnancies. They're 40% less likely, likely to get pap smears, 20% less like to, likely to be asked about smoking, even if they're smokers. And if somebody is a major, has major mobility problems, they're not going to be able to hyperinflate their lungs. They're going to be at higher risk of developing pneumonias if they get upper respiratory infections. And so it's really important for their doctors to be talking to them about smoking. But the number that I want to focus on today is the 30% less likely to get mammograms. Now, if, however, they do get a mammogram or get a breast examin examination and are found to have breast cancer, at stage one, there are basically two equivalent therapies. One is mastectomy, where you basically have your breast entirely removed surgically. The other is a lumpectomy, or breast conserving surgery, where you basically have the tumor removed. And then to have the same disease-free survival as mastectomy, women have to have radiation therapy afterwards, okay? So what this slide shows, and these are data from the SEER cancer registries that we analyze. These are cancer registries that the National Cancer Institute puts out that cover about 14% of the U.S. population, so big sample sizes, as you can see from the ends up there. 
Um, the mastectomies are much more common among disabled women, 45% compared to 38% for the non-disabled women. The disabled women, 54% get lumpectomy compared to 62% or so for the non-disabled women. And once you adjust for all sorts of characteristics, including tumor type and the aggressiveness of the tumor, the adjusted relative rate of women with disabilities getting, um, getting the lumpectomy is 0 0.76. In other words, they're 24% less likely to get um, lumpectomies than mastectomies. Now, okay, there might be lots of reasons for this, lots of reasons that women with disabilities are more likely to have their breasts entirely removed than undergo lumpectomy. And I'm not saying that this is necessarily a bad finding, but because there are multiple reasons for this, possibly. But remember that I said that if you have a lumpectomy, you have to have radiotherapy afterwards to have the same disease for survival. And what we did after we controlled for all these factors listed in the third bullet, age, um, race, ethnicity, et cetera, was we found that women at stage one who were disabled and had had breast conserving surgery were 17% less likely than other women to get the radiation therapy. And so therefore, if they did have the breast conserving surgery, they got poorer quality of care, 17% less likely to get radiation therapy. So let's go back even further. We started with you know, the big population picture. Let's go to an individual woman. This is a woman who I interviewed in her home. I'm gonna call her Mrs. Shannon. She was 56 years old at the time of the interview. She'd had polio at 17 months and had been a wheelchair user since age 22 and she's now basically um, tetraplegic. She uses a ventilator to help her breathe. She's lived with a man named Eric for 23 years. She has not married him because if she did, she would lose her Medicaid coverage. She has a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling and had worked for years earlier um, as a research assistant, so an educated woman. Um, Eric talked about what it was like to take his wife, or his, his common-law wife, um, to um, a mammography test with inaccessible equipment, equipment that would not allow her as a wheelchair user to roll right into the mammogram machine. I would hold onto her back and push her into the mammography machine while the machine did its thing. So I was right there for her. Now, keep in mind, he's not shielded from the radiation that's happening during this moment. So there is teeny weeny weeny, but little tiny risk to him there. Okay, sorry. Um, now, it turned out that Mrs. Shannon also had inflammatory bowel disease, and so she had a gastroenterologist as well. It was her gastroenterologist who found the lump because her gastroenterologist had actually got her out of the wheelchair for a full, complete examination of her belly on the table, whereas her primary care doctor always examined her as she sat in her wheelchair and just really never detected the breast cancer. Now, when she went to have breast surgery, um, she and Eric were concerned that the surgeon really did not care how much the surgeon cut out of her breast. The surgeon just didn't seem, according to them, to care whether her breast was smaller after the surgery than it was beforehand. And so I was trying to get a very strong statement from them because they were kind of saying that they thought it was because of her disability. And so I did something that students in the room qualitative investigators are never supposed to do, okay? But I did it, I asked a leading question. Do you think that they thought that because you're disabled that it wouldn't matter to you about your breast size? Yep, said Mrs. Shannon. That's what you thought, said me? Yes, absolutely, said Mrs. Shannon. Now, when she went to have a radiation therapy, the, ther the tables in the radiation therapy place were not accessible, and women typically need to have radiation therapy every day for like eight weeks after, um, you know, 68 weeks after um, their breast, um, can breast cancer is removed. And so there's a lot of lifting that Eric had to do. Um, Eric, though, is diabetic, and in more recent years, he's got bad legs, so it's hard to lift her sometimes. If they need her to get on a table, I will put her on even though at risk to himself. So, the major threats from this are physical access barrier, potentially discriminatory attitudes among the breast surgeon, 
and other issues that I won't go into now about the complexity. Um, you know, basically, as I'm going to talk about later, women with polio have been excluded from all studies about breast cancer treatment, and so it's really hard to know what kind of therapy to give a woman with polio. <coughs> Sorry. But, okay, so that's just a, a introduction. Have I convinced you that there's disparities in care? Yes, okay, that's good. all right. That was the right answer. <laughs> okay, history and laws. Okay, I know tomorrow's an election, <laughs> and this is not a political <laughs> statement, okay? This is, um, this is just my slide to remind us that disability is often the elephant in the room. You know, it's this really huge thing. People don't want to talk about it, or they feel and touch different parts of it, and they don't really, you know, from their little piece that they see, they don't necessarily know what, what it is. Now, if you Google images for hunter-gatherer societies, this is a picture that will come up, okay? And so I show this just to remind me to tell you, remember, why were societies created in the first place? Obviously, so people could care for people who are less able to care for themselves. The most obvious example are infants and children. You need villages, right, to care for children and take care of children. But there would be also older people who couldn't hunt, couldn't gather, couldn't subsist without the help of societies. And so that's really why human societies first formed. But even going back as far back as Old Testament writings, there's evidence that people with disabilities were stigmatized. This is from the Old Testament book of Leviticus. It's talking about people <coughs> who should not be allowed to approach an altar during a religious service. Quote, a man who is blind or lame, or one with a mutilated face, or a limb too long, or a hunchback, or a dwarf. Obviously, there were some reasons why certain people might be excluded. This is um, Peter Bruegel, the elder's painting called The Cripples. Um, uh, it's not entirely clear who these people are, but there's uh, some thought that these are people who were lepers back in the like, 14th century. Um, and there is writing from Europe back as far ago as the 14th century about how um, some people um, would try to get alms from the local alms houses because they said that they were disabled, but in fact they were faking their disabilities. They really just didn't want to work, they didn't want to try, they didn't want to strive, quote unquote. So um, they had to figure out some way to separate, as Deborah Stone, political scientist, wrote in her 1984 book, The Disabled State, disability has always been problematic because physical and mental incapacity can be feigned for secondary gain. Hence, the concept of disability has always been based on a perceived need to detect deception. Now, this is a picture of the stethoscope that was invented by René Lenac, a French physician, in like 1814 or so. Um, and this was one of the first of many tools that were actually invented in the 19th century that allowed, quote, physicians to objectively determine whether somebody actually had something wrong with them. And so this was the first of several tools that would allow some professional, like a physician, to figure out whether somebody was faking or not. And oftentimes when I give this talk in front of people who read medical history, they remind me that the other thing that the stethoscope did was distance patients from their physicians. Mm -hmm. It used to be that to hear the heart sounds, physicians would lay their ear on the chest of the patient. But this stethoscope allows the physician now to distance himself, okay, say that deliberately, distance himself from the patient and also be the objective decider of whether that patient is sick. So physicians got this authority to become the objective arbiters of whether somebody was deserving or not as a disabled person. Um, physicians to this day determine whether somebody is eligible for income support, health insurance, other social programs. And this can put physicians and patients at loggerheads at times if physicians feel, oh, this patient should still be working, you know, whereas the patient thinks, no, it's time for me to be on disability insurance. Now this created what is called, you know, in the very, very little catchphrase, the medical model of disability, that disability is a problem of an individual person and the cause is disease, trauma, some sort of health condition. The solution is a cure or medical treatment and if you can't be cured or treated, then you just accept your lot in life 
and you make adjustments to loss and limitations. And as one of the women who I interviewed said to me, disability is a lonely state. Now this was probably one of the loneliest disabled people of the 20th century. I hope the young people in the room, you do know who this is, right? Okay, good, this is FDR, who at age 39 developed polio and never walked again. And this is one of two remaining photographs of him in his wheelchair. Um, but in fact, after FDR, Lots happened. We had the late 60s and early 70s where we had civil rights um, marches in the street for women and racial and ethnic minorities. The independent living movement started first in Berkeley, California. And in fact, the Boston for Center, Center for Independent Living started here at BU. Um, back um, and was back in the s early 70s, I think, and was the second Center for Independent Living actually in the country. And what those did was to help people with disabilities figure out how to live independently outside of institutions in the com community. We also had consumers who decided, you know, I don't want to go to a doctor for everything. I want to be able to figure out how, how to help myself, rather than requiring professional help all the time. And so we developed what is, you know, just briefly called the social model of disability, that disability is a problem of society that fails to accommodate people who are different. The causes are stigmatizing attitudes, failure to build accessible facilities, environments. The solutions are to change social thinking and to make communities accessible. And disability under this formulation became a human rights issue. Now the disability rights movement never filled the streets the way that the um, civil rights movements for women and racial and ethnic minorities did. And remember the slide where I talked about 54 million Americans living with disabilities? That's all the way from, you know, kid with cerebral palsy to a young adult with a learning disability to an elderly person with Alzheimer's disease. People are all different, you know. And so there just wasn't necessarily that connection, that spark of unanimity that there was with the women's rights movements or the racial and ethnic minority civil rights movements. But the ADA ultimately passed because even people in the administration and congressmen and senators and House of Representatives members realized that they or their families would inevitably be touched by it, and it just seemed the right thing to do. Now, of course, um, we got to this wonderful moment on the Mall where George um, Herbert Walker Bush is signing the ADA, and then we had... Um, a very broad definition of disability um, where uh, Section 3 of the ADA defines disability very, very broadly as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of major life activities. And by the way, for people, I'm reading this because I understand there's a radio kind of taping of this. Um, and so I just want to make sure that since radio listeners can't see my slides, that, that they know what's going on here. Okay, so, um, and then B, a record of such an impairment, or C, being regarded as having an impairment. So very, very broad definitions of disability. But then we had the Supreme Court. These very, very so sober and somber people who spent a number of years kind of ratcheting back, um, ratcheting back what this definition would include um, and in fact, the ADA is different in civil rights, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes, um, than other types of civil rights laws because for people to apply under the ADA and get dispensation under the ADA, they first have to prove that they are disabled. You know, if you apply for protection for civil rights as a racial and ethnic minority or as a woman, or uh, you don't first have to prove that you're a woman, right? But in the ADA, you first have to prove that you're disabled. And so the first thing that the Supreme Court got working on was, um, was some, of these, uh, some of these proofs. And so it led to the September 28, um, 2008 signing by George W. Bush with his dad there on the left, you can see, of the um, ADA um, uh, um, Amendments Act, and um, this furthers the ADA in terms of specifying who qualifies as disabled because the Supreme Court had really ratcheted back who would qualify as disabled under that rubric. Okay, so just to pause briefly to make really crystal clear how the ADA really differs from other, other civil rights acts. Now, people will recognize this iconic figure. This is Rosa Parks, 
who in December of 1955 refused to give up a seat on her bus to a white passenger and refused to move to the back of the bus. Now Rosa Parks would know that she had achieved civil rights when the color of her skin was irrelevant to where she sat on that bus. People might notice the color of her skin, but it didn't matter. She could sit wherever she wanted to. Her stigmatizing trait was irrelevant to where she sat on that bus. Now, for somebody like me to even get onto the bus, my stigmatizing trait needs to be right out front, okay? I need to wave down that bus, get the bus driver to notice me, not as who I am, not as Lisa, but as a disabled person in a wheelchair. That bus driver has to agree to fold down the ramp, and I'm phrasing it very specifically because there are sometimes buses that will just roll by and say, oh, my ramp doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and the bus needs to be configured so that I can get onto it, okay? So this just kind of really makes clear how there are kind of some big differences between civil rights um, for racial and ethnic minorities and women and for, um, for disability. Now, what's kind of shocking is that you would think that the obvious thing that the ADA did was to make buildings accessible, but um, I just want to review one case really, really quickly, and this is Tennessee v. Lane um, that the Supreme Court argued in January 13th of 2004. Um, this was a man named George Lane who was a wheelchair user and had been um, caught with misdemeanor traffic violations. He wasn't necessarily a good citizen, but nevertheless, he deserved his day in court. Okay, and he um, went to, to Benton, Tennessee, where he lived, to the courthouse for his arraignment. And in the morning, um, he had to go into a courtroom upstairs in a building that did not have an elevator. And so he had gotten out of his wheelchair, and he was strong enough that he was able to climb up the stairs with his arms to get there for his morning arraignment. But he had to go back in the afternoon for some other court proceeding. And he refused to get out of his wheelchair to climb up the stairs for his afternoon arraignment. He also refused to allow the guards to carry him up the stairs. And so he was put into jail for failure to appear in the courtroom. And so he sued Tennessee under Title II of the ADA um, because he, um, he felt that he was discriminated against by having a court proceeding in a room that he could not get into. Now, um, J. Paul Stevens, um, uh, who is the Supreme Court Justice who just resigned, um, wrote the five to four majority opinion, as thin as it can be, in favor of the wheelchair user. That, and um, John Paul Stevens said that everybody has a right to be in a courtroom. You know, that that's just a really fundamental right. But in the minority, Rehnquist, the late Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, wrote, What's the problem with being carried up the stairs? I don't see it as such a big deal. Get you up there, right? Okay, so we are still at this five to four majority. And basically, um, the feeling is that from this, from the way that um, Stevens wrote the opinion that said that you should have access to a courtroom, it sounded like you had to adjudicate access to all different kinds of facilities. Mm -hmm. And so the courtrooms were the first ones, but it's not necessarily obvious that wheelchair users will have independent access to every facility under the, um, under the provisions of the ADA. Okay. All right. Okay, so barriers to health care. All right, so there's a lot of barriers to care. Um, inadequate knowledge among clinicians, physical barriers, reimbursement policies, which I'm not going to talk about today because that's a talk unto itself and we just don't have time. But attitudinal <laughs> barriers um, that we'll talk about a little bit. Okay, so let's go through this. All right, evidence gaps. As you all know, the randomized controlled trial is the gold standard evidence for what works and what doesn't work in healthcare, right? Well, people with disabilities are routinely excluded right off the top from every randomized controlled trial that you can look up in the journals, okay? Um, and so, therefore, for example, for Mrs. Shannon, there was virtually no evidence for, to tell her what type of drug therapy she should have for her breast cancer if she needed it because women with disabilities have been excluded from all of the trials to guide breast cancer treatment decisions. 
Oftentimes also there's small numbers of cases with specific disabilities and so it's hard to know, for example, um, what type of treatment to recommend for a specific type of disability. And then there's, of course, admittedly, even in my profession, even in my profession, we do not always practice evidence-based medicine, but especially in some of the fields that you teach here, um, the evidence base is beginning to grow, but it certainly isn't what it needs to be um, for physical therapy, occupational therapy, and so on, although obviously it's unlikely that you're going to exclude people with disabilities from a lot of your studies, although you might from some of them. <laughs> I'm not sure. Now, it's also amazing how um, <laughs> in some of our studies, we, we heard people with spinal cord injury tell us that when they would go to a doctor for example, a little procedure on their lower limb below the level of their spinal cord injury, like a mole removal by a dermatologist, that the dermatologist would refuse to get them lidocaine because he thought, oh, this patient couldn't possibly have pain. They've got a spinal cord injury. You know, and of course this is wrong. And so we found again and again um, from the people that we interviewed that clinicians just fail to understand or listen to their patients about their patient's own knowledge of their setting, situation. Now, in terms of physical barriers, admittedly, you know, this is where I work. This is the Massachusetts General Hospital. This is a Bullfinch building. It was built in the 19th century. Okay, it's not a terribly accessible place. Um, however, you know, you can kind of see it down there. It's embedded. Can people see? I can't really operate the laser printer pointer, but it's right in there. The MGH has grown up all around it. Mm -hmm. But I, I just show this to make the point that especially in a lot of the big American cities, the major healthcare facilities were among the earliest buildings built. And so therefore, they are often the oldest ones and have the most barriers. And the ADA has a standard in it that if you renovate an old building, you have to make it accessible so long as doing so is readily achievable, i.e., it wouldn't cost too much money to do it, and the engineering is feasible. Okay, so there are going to be some old buildings that it's not going to be readily achievable to get people like me into, but it should not be healthcare buildings, okay? Um, now, my feeling is, you know, when, when we talk about the fact that, um, that healthcare is so far behind many other, um, other settings where people do business and have transactions and so on, even movie theaters and, um, and shops and so on, why is it that healthcare is so inaccessible often? And I think that often it goes back to this notion of beneficence, you know, that healthcare professionals have their patient's best interest at heart. And so they are always doing things for the patient. They take care of the patient. We care for patients. If you think about that language, it's actually very strong and emotive language. We're kindly, but we're in control. And if patients want to be moved, clinicians will move them. Patients are not considered to be independent in healthcare settings. They are very much the dependent. They're the patients. They should have patients, okay? Now, however, this really doesn't work in some situations. Um, this is a quote from a woman with spinal cord injury. And as people know or may not know, um, oftentimes chemotherapy doses are set by the person's weight, okay? And so this woman had a spinal cord injury as a young, as a young person, um, graduation day, um, car crash. Okay, celebrating, bad thing, but you know, she's doing really well with it, lives a full life in her 40s now, and she develops breast cancer. But the clinic where she goes does not have a weight scale that is wheelchair accessible. And so the way that she got weighed was that her oncologist lifted her out of her wheelchair, and he held me in his arms on the scale to weigh me. Ah. <sighs> This is a quote from a woman with cerebral palsy who could not hold her arm in place during the radiation therapy. She was put onto the table. She could get up onto the table with the lift devices that they had. But then you have to position your arm so the radiation doesn't hit your arm. It goes straight to the part of your breast where it has to 
um, touch the tumor area. The only way that they, in this radiation oncology facility, could figure out to get her arm out of the way was to use masking tape. Now there's Velcro straps, you know, there's all sorts of other technologies that they could have used, like they use a Velcro strap actually to strap women onto the table so, they don't, so their bodies don't move. Why couldn't they have had a Velcro strap for her arm? But no, they masking taped her onto the table every day that she got the radiation. Now, I showed this slide. This is another Google Images you know, for transferring. Um, just to remind us that behind truckers, healthcare professionals have the second highest rate of occupational injuries, nurses and practice assistants. And that is because they're always having to transfer patients. And transferring patients is a dangerous thing. So it's not only dangerous for the patients to be transferred with equipment, without any equipment to transfer them effectively, but it's also dangerous for the healthcare professional. Now, Kaiser Permanente found this out the hard way, 10 years to the day after um, the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. This was July 26, 2000, when three wheelchair users sued them for in for lack of access. Um, and one of the plaintiffs was um, a man named John Lomberg, who had been quadriplegic for 18 years, and he had asked repeatedly for a physical examination. But he was told by his clinicians that they did not have an adjustable height examining table that lowered automatically to 18 to 20 inches off the floor so he could transfer easily. They also said that they didn't have the staff to be able to transfer him physically. So he was brewing a decubitus ulcer for a year that went undetected. And if anybody knows anything about decubitus ulcers, you know that this is a horrible, horrible situation. And even if he gets a good surgical repair, um, that area of his skin will never be the same it, it, again. He will, for the rest of his life, have a risk there. It was published on the front page of the LA Times the next day. It was kind of embarrassing to Kaiser. And so they settled in um, March of 2001 without this actually going to court. But they are still now, 10 years later, they have not yet made their facilities fully accessible, although they are working on it, very actively working on it. Now, of course, the New Yorker cartoon always reminds us that there are little zings and zaps um, in how people feel about uh, various kind of high, um, high visibility social cultural issues of the time. This is perhaps my favorite. Um, <laughs> this is <laughs> from the April 2004 cartoon issue of The New Yorker. And when I got this, um, it's a picture of a very, I would, I would have to say grumpy, wouldn't you? Yeah, grumpy, grumpy elderly lady with a four-point walker about to put it on four banana peels. Um, so I emailed this around to friends of mine around the country to say, you know, what do you think of this? And I got back. Um, an email from a physiatrist at University of Pennsylvania who is a wheelchair user from birth because of a congenital condition that she had. And she wrote me back and she said, oh, this is a hilarious picture. It's so appealing, A-P-E-L-I-N-G, <laughs> you know? And um, some of my ambulatory friends wrote me back and they said, oh my God, how could a New Yorker have put something like this on the cover of their um, cartoon issue? Obviously, you know, I view this as kind of a Rorschach test. It, it's a picture that makes some people uncomfortable. It just tells us that our society is not quite completely figured out what we mean about this. Uh oh. Right. Um, I was, this was working before. It may have lost its, okay. Um, and the point that I wanted to make is that people with disabilities are remarkably practical. We live 24 7 with our wheelchairs, right? We, yeah. We know how to get around. We know what to do. Yes, if the elevator's broken, we have to figure out some other way to do things. Um, but if we can't do it one way, we just figure out some way to do it another way. And so um, uh, it, it just is um, something that is staggering to me that people um, don't you know, view people with disabilities often as dependent because we really have, have had to figure out a lot of things. So, okay, the final, final part of my talk. Crossing the Quality Chasm was a report that came out of the Institute of Medicine in 2001 that talked about the dreadful gaps between 
where we as a nation aspire for the quality of our health care to be and where it actually was in the year 2001 and frankly it hasn't changed too much since then. Um, and Don Berwick, who now is the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, at the time was the head of the Institute for Healthcare Impu Improvement in Cambridge, wrote a little guide to how to interpret on the Crossing the Quality Chasm Report in the journal Health Affairs. Mm -hmm. And there were six pillars of healthcare reform that were talked about in the Crossing the Cal Quality Chasm Report, and one of the six pillars was patient-centered care. Um, and that is care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patients' preferences, needs, and values. And Don Berwick called this really the true north to guide healthcare reform. Now, empathic communication for you who are training to be clinicians in this room is one way to go about beginning to get to the place where you can have patient-centered care. That is the kind of communication where you really try to understand each other. And that kind of understanding itself can be intensely therapeutic. It bridges the isolation of illness and helps to restore the sense of connection that patients need to feel whole. So, just um, the bottom line, number one, and I have two bottom lines in my talk. The bottom line, number one, is for you to make no assumptions about the patients who you see, about their abilities, their needs, their preferences, their expectations, their values, how they live their life, what they want to do in their lives. Don't make any assumptions, just ask them. And then, after you ask them and they tell you what they want, work collaboratively with them to try to achieve the patient's goals. Now, there are tools to help you do this. I just show this because the Department of Justice finally, just a couple of months ago, I mean, it's kind of amazing in time for the 20th birthday of the ADA, they finally came out with a guide to how to make accessible medical facilities that you can find on the web 20 years later. Okay, But anyway, um, so, so there is some information to help you figure out how to make your facility more accessible. But I wanted to point out also that this, people, I don't know if you can tell what this is. This is the vote that eventually led to the passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act that Barack Obama signed on March 23rd, 2010. It's got a lot of provisions in it, but one of the provisions of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is something called Section 510 which is actually establishment of standards for accessible medical diagnostic equipment. Isn't that nifty? Finally, you know, the ADA actually talks about accessible buildings, but it doesn't say anything about accessible examining tables, mammography equipment, x-ray machines, but that's what this Section 510 is doing. And it requires the Access Board, a federal agency, a federal kind of NGO or it's kind of an agency, to a year from the passage of the ADA, or the, um, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, um, which would be March 23rd, 2011, to come up with standards or preliminary standards for accessible medical diagnostic equipment. Now, there's a whole kind of um, movement in the design field called universal design. And this is basically more a mindset than an absolute. But what it really means is a, an approach towards design, towards making not just facilities, but also policies, communication devices, you know, the way that you teach, everything that you do as a human with other humans, designing that in a way that considers as many potential users as possible. Um, and in healthcare, you need to consider not just the full range of patients, but also the fact that families are going to visit, that clinicians might sometimes have disabilities, other staff might have disabilities. And so universal design within healthcare facilities really touches on a whole array of different potential users. So remember, when you're thinking about designing any of these policies or buildings and so on, it's cheaper to do it right from the start than renovating later. ADA standards are a bare minimum. The ADA, actually, I went to your bathroom on the first floor. It's great. It's got this wonderful paddle, push paddle, to allow you to get in 
The ADA actually does not require that. It does not require automatic door openers on interior doors. And so, for example, a major healthcare facility opened up down the street, you know, um, 16 years after the ADA passed, they didn't have push buttons for getting into their clinic. You know, what is that going to tell the patient who shows up there with a walker or a cane that that person cannot get into that door of that clinic? Um, so people say, well, how can we think about designing accessible spaces? You can now go to the federal website, but you can also just ask people with disabilities to partner with you and help you think about it. And so my second and final bottom line was that adopting a universal design perspective will be helpful not only to your patients with disabilities, but also to you as staff, to families. And remember, baby boomers like me are coming. Um, we're going to bring our disabilities um, into the public sphere of healthcare facilities everywhere we go. And it makes sense for everybody, you know, businesses and um, especially healthcare facilities with their humanistic mission, mission to consider the fact that the 54 million people with Americans now is just <laughs> going to burgeon and, and balloon in the decades ahead. So I always like to end with a slide of Independence Day. Um, and so that's the end of my talk. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Them. Thank you. We have, Lisa, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. There are microphones, so if you could just put up your hand if you have a question and someone will bring you a microphone um, for your question. So, questions? There's one over here, I see. I think, can you just wait one sec? I think they want to get the questions recorded. Hi. Um, I'm a PhD student here, and I was just curious. I actually, I have MS, so I'm very aware of buildings that don't have accessibility and everything. And the first two schools I went to for my bachelor's and master's had, uh, even with asking about classrooms, I had to have, like, bathrooms to be on the second floor with open stairs and everything. And they kind of said, well, it's grandfathered. So I was curious in buildings like that, how, if that's, a la I mean, allowed or allowed, and how, how to handle that, because it's hard for students, so... You know, I'm not sure how that is here. My buildings have been accessible, but. Yeah. Well, um, there are people who are a lot better equipped than I am in this room to answer a specific question about how the law would work. Um, educational institutions get a lot of federal money, and so they should have been thinking about this back to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 that actually Section 504 mm -hmm. started this for, um, for buildings that had, you know, people that got any federal money in it. And so, you know, I, I think that, um, that what healthcare or, or um, educational facilities should be doing in a situation like that is simply not not having classes in buildings where you cannot get into the bathroom. Um, that they might have to change their schedule and, and if they happen to know that a particular student is going to be in that class, they can maybe have the, the class in a different room. It doesn't seem to me that it would be all that hard if at the beginning of a semester or before the semester starts you identify students who need special accommodations, making plans for where the rooms for that student's teaching are going to take place doesn't seem like it should be that hard. Yeah. Other questions? I'll hand over Lisa, could I add on to your Sure, presentation? absolutely, yeah. I think it would be helpful for folks to know that according to uh, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is done nationally here in Massachusetts, the persons with disabilities are more likely to smoke, more likely to be overweight, yeah. less likely to participate in physical activity, Less likely they've seen a doctor in the past, past year to, due, to, uh, due to cost. More likely to be missing six or more teeth. Um, and there was one, oh, and more likely to be subject to violence within, uh, by their partner. Um, and I also just, if I could kind of correct one thing. Uh, the 80, folks with disabilities were not passive. Uh, but we're very active in the passage of the, of the Americans with Disability Act. Oh, absolutely. They were very active. It's just that they didn't get to, you know, there were different silos of people with different types of disabilities. It took a lot of work to kind of get them all together in the room to kind of talk to each other. People chain themselves to yeah. 
the adapt, gates, people to, change uh, themselves to buses. Absolutely. We, we have closed down the state house. We've done quite a few mm -hmm. activities. Yeah, and oh that, yeah. Yeah, there the, were major sit-ins in San Francisco in the Jimmy and Carter it, era. Yeah, yep. And in a recent in a recent survey of folks with disabilities, fifty about fifty percent self identify as being part of a distinct population. Which is which is which is very which is so there's new and emerging understanding what disability is as it as it as it's something that interacts with the environment as well as um, as well as being uh, as a population of folks from the civil rights perspective I guess that was I just yeah that was, that was it thank you good thank, thank you. you questions Lisa, I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of your lecture was about uh, the fact that physicians are not very sensitive uh, to the issues of people with disabilities. So, I, you know, what are medical schools doing these days to train physicians to be more sensitive? And do people like you, um, <laughs> you know, interact with medical students such that they uh, are more uh, knowledgeable about these issues now? I'm looking at Larry Culpepper in the front of the room, who's a family. You run the family practice residency at Boston University Medical School. I suspect that you do a lot more about this. I know that you do. Um, we're hopeless. Um, I think medical school training, um, I, I have managed to winnow my way into giving an hour lecture in the course of the four years <laughs> to the medical students. And it, it's taken me a while mm -hmm. to be able to do that and not all of the students do at Harvard hear, hear from me. Um, I think that uh, there are some movements afoot around the country at some different medical schools. UMass Medical School out in Worcester actually has a fairly active effort to try to teach students about mm -hmm. disabilities. But I think that, um, that a lot of doctors really feel that it's not their bailiwick. You know, that it's something, oh, they'll send them to the PT or the OT, although they often don't know what the PT and OT does. <laughs> Is that true, folks? Yeah, they often don't know what you guys do. And so they probably don't refer patients to you as soon as they should. Um, and that is something really that I think um, needs to be fixed, that there needs to be, because interdisciplinary teams are really, especially with a patient-centered medical home movement, going to be where people are hoping that medicine will go in the future. And that would really require physicians being aware of what other professionals do that could really help them partner on care for their patients with disabilities. Larry, did I? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you think about the you know, sort of the issues, I, I think uh, the the default in medical schools to say, oh, disabilities. Well, that, that belongs to physiatry or maybe neurology well, or, or some subspecialty yeah, of a right, subspecialty, right, 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 yeah. mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to being an issue that really every medical student, yeah, I mean, every healthcare provider should, you know, should, uh, uh, you know, really learn the skills and the principles and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Um, the hopeful piece is that, you know, certainly in family medicine, uh, we're involved in developing a national curriculum about this, just sort of saying, okay, we can't get in medical school, at least we can get it into primary care at, uh, you know, at the residency level and have a uh, you know, sort of a model uh, curriculum that, that really becomes standard. Uh, but pushing that down to the medical school years is um, still yeah, a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? I see one in the back, uh, maybe this. Time for one more. Um, speaking so widely and having written on the subject, I was wondering if every time you encounter a place that isn't easily accessible for you, do you talk to the people there? Do you try to make change? Or at some point, do you just have to say, I can't you know, change everything? <laughs> oh, that's such a great question. Um, you know something? If you felt like 24-7 you had to educate everybody, you'd be exhausted. <laughs> so I'm selective, okay? Um, and I think also that as a person with a disability, you have to be very careful in how you present yourself because 
You know, just like Barack Obama said that he had schooled himself to not appear to be the angry black male, you know, I'm very aware that people would view me as though she's angry because she's upset about her disability or, you know, they would marginalize what I would say if I confronted things in a hostile manner or a way that seemed threatening to people who think that they've done things the right way. And so, um, you know, I will confess, I, I've been using a chair now since 1988, so that's 22 years. So I've seen quite a bit, although I have learned that I can't say that I've seen it all because every once in a while something new happens that just like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I never would have thought that would have happened. Um, but, um, you know, there, my, my current thing is um, trying to get the Transportation Security Administration screeners at airports not to keep calling me honey and dear. <laughs> and so I'll go up to the manager and I'll say, you know, is it actually okay for the screeners as they're patting me down, since I can't walk through the, you know, little device, to keep saying, oh, honey, oh, dear, you know. And apparently it's not. Mm -hmm. And so I'll say to them, well, you should probably do some in-service training with your screeners um, to teach them, you know, even though I think people are afraid of confronting the TSA people at the airport now, right? Mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. <laughs> you, you don't want to appear to be willing to allow those terrorists to get through. Uh-oh, right there, you know, recording <laughs> devices. I am flying tomorrow. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was another question back in here, yeah. Thank you for your talk this afternoon. So in the spirit of inclusion, do you have any words of wisdom or testimonial experiences to share with uh, some of our students who may have disabilities? themselves in terms of entering into the field and participating in their clinical training experiences? Oh boy, that, what time is it? <laughs> two minutes, two minutes. Um, I graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1984, which was six years before the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. And I was told by the head of a major Harvard teaching hospital when I asked him whether it might be possible for me to do, I have multiple sclerosis, whether it might be possible for me to do a half-time residency or part-time program to do training. He paused for a second and he said, well, there are too many doctors in the United States right now for us to worry about training a handicapped physician. If that means that certain people get left by the wayside, so be it. Um, the person who is my assigned internship advisor, the person who writes your letter and helps you figure out where to apply to your internships, told me that they had talked about me and they had decided that it really wasn't going to be possible for me to go on in my training. That what they might be able to do is to pass a hat to the chairs of Department of Medicine at the Harvard Teaching Hospitals to try to come up with a salary for me for a position that would not be board eligible. So I would never be able to be board certified, which is a major credential. And they thought that they would be able to offer me a salary of $3,000 a year. Now my understanding, lawyers can correct me about this, that this is something called constructive dismissal that this is actually, they didn't outright get rid of me, but they made my life so miserable that I went away. <laughs> you know, and I tell that story, and, and trust me, there could be hours more if I choose to vent myself here. Um, I tell this story just to make very clear that I think 2010 is completely different, that my experiences are not relevant anymore because I think that the ADA has protected students now in a way that my generation just simply wasn't protected. Nevertheless, I think that it is very possible that the students will continue to face subtle attitudes that they will recognize but 
that it will be hard for them to feel that they can get other people to believe or other people to take seriously. So just I'll tell a, a, a brief story and then I'll finish. Um, about, oh, maybe eight, nine, ten years ago, um, I went to interview for an endowed chair at a big university. You know, I'm on soft money. <laughs> I'm constantly working for grants. I would love to have an endowed chair. You know, so I went to interview for this endowed chair. And I called the week before to ask the secretary whether all the places where I would be interviewing when I came for the visit would be wheelchair accessible. There was a pause over the phone. Oh, we didn't know you use a wheelchair. So I get out there, and the person who had invited me for the interviews never looked me in the eye. Didn't say goodbye to me at the end of two days of interviews. OK, but wouldn't I sound really stupid saying, he didn't look me in the eye. He didn't say goodbye to me. You know, wouldn't I sound like a whiner if I said that? Who's going to believe that? But yet, you know, I never heard from them again, not even a letter of thanks for having come out, which is a standard kind of. But listen to that. That sounds like I'm whining, right? But it's very real. And so I think that the biggest risk for the students is that they could be perceived as whining. They could be perceived as not trying as hard. You know, um, and I think that the challenge for you is being able to recognize that there are still discriminatory attitudes out there. And especially if your students go out into environments that are outside of your immediate control. Like I don't know if you go to some of the big teaching hospitals. I don't know if you go to BU Medical Center out on the wards. You know, probably people who are learning respiratory therapy certainly go to ICUs and so on. You know, that, that you might, that there still are going to be attitudes out there. Um, but the students otherwise, I think, will be able to have the careers that they should be allowed to have, given their level of abilities, just as always. Okay. Lisa, yeah. thank you very much You're for welcome. an incredibly thought-provoking <laughs> talk.